Good morning again. Good morning again. <laughs> Welcome to worship. Christ is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. Great to see you all here today. I'm not Steve. I'm Nellie Walker, and I'm filling in for Steve while he's out of town. Um, thank you to Pastor Steve Beckham for being here again today. Um, he's been here for several weeks and also as our previous pastor, so we're thrilled to have him back. Um, no real announcements of things coming up this week, but on the horizon, um, June 8th is our 70th anniversary celebration, and all, all current and for, former members and friends are invited, and it's at four o'clock on the, the lawn, um, so there'll be more information coming on that. Uh, and then June 9th is the church celebration uh, for the anniversary, so that's something to put on your calendars. Also, our our garden ministry of Grace Community Garden continues. Pastor John applied for a $250 grant for uh, Thrivent, so we uh, have that donation already, and um, possibly we'll be able to start the children's uh, planter boxes for the children's center. So um, good things are happening here, and we're excited that the bells are here to play today, and that you're all here, and um, we'll, we can worship together. So I'll turn it over to Pastor Steve. It flipped itself back. <laughs> Thank you. So there's my sin to confess. <laughs> Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. If your compassion Forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for salvation, let us pray to the Lord. be with you. Let us pray together our prayer of the day. O Lord Christ, good shepherd of the sheep, you seek the lost and guide us into your fold. Feed us and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be whole. Make us one with you, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Peter and John had been arrested the previous day because they were proclaiming the news of the resurrection to the people. In today's reading, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit so that he can proclaim salvation in Jesus' name to the religious authorities. A reading from the fourth chapter of Acts. The next day, the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. The word of the Lord.
Please stand as you're able for a reading from the Gospel. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. And now may the words of my mouth and the medications of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my Redeemer and my Rock. Amen. Please be seated. You know, it seems to me that when I was pastor here 20 some odd years ago, this was lower. Or maybe I was a little bit taller. (laughs) It's been really nice to be back here with you all the past few weeks. And I'll be back again in a couple of weeks. Um, But I just want to say it's it's been a joy and a treat to be here with you for these last few weeks. You are one of a kind. Even if you have an identical twin, There's a lot about you that is unique. Your fingerprints are unique, of course. I remember when I I was here years ago, you remember Bob Da? Bob worked on a system to electronically identify fingerprints. I don't know if you all knew that. He was one of the pioneers in that area. And now we all use it to open our phones and our iPads. Your fingerprints are unique, of course, but did you know that your toe prints are too? Your voice print is also unique and can be used to identify you. The patterns in your irises of your eyes are yours and yours alone, and so are the patterns of the blood vessels in your retinas. Your gait when you walk is uniquely yours and can be used to pick you out of a crowd. You can be singled out from a multitude of other people online by patterns in the way you type on your keyboard or or move your mouse, a little trick that's been used apparently in espionage. But this one, this was a new one to me. Did you know that you have a distinctive cardiac signature? That's right. Your heart beats in a way that is unique to you and can't be disguised. The Pentagon has recently developed a laser-based tool called Jetson that can read your cardiac signature through your clothes from 200 meters away. So now if somebody says they know your heart, you might want to ask exactly what they mean by that. (laughs) I know my own and my own know me, said Jesus, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Jesus knows your heart, although clearly not in the same way the Pentagon does. More importantly, though, we know the heart of Jesus. We know he loves us and he cares for us enough to lay down his life for us. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. I wonder how many of us really understand what he meant by that. 
I think what comes to mind for a lot of us when we hear Good Shepherd is a kind of a greeting card image um, or like a picture from a stained glass window. We picture Jesus looking all pristine in a nice flowing white robe, maybe holding a nice perfectly white little lamb over his shoulders. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But that image is a far cry from what the people listening to Jesus on that long ago day in Jerusalem would have been picturing when Jesus described himself as a good shepherd. When Jesus was talking to people 2,000 years ago in Galilee and Judea, he used metaphors that were part of their everyday lives. Many of these metaphors also echoed their scriptures and their history. That's one of the things that made him such an effective teacher. But it also made him controversial sometimes. Even people who had never been outside of Jerusalem's walls knew about shepherds. They were a common sight. They'd all seen shepherds bringing sheep into the city for the markets and for the sacrifices in the temple. The shepherd was also an image from their faith heritage. Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, had been a shepherd. Jacob worked as a shepherd for Laban so he could marry Rachel and Leah, who had also tended sheep. Zipporah, the wife of Moses, had tended flocks with her sisters. Moses tended sheep before God called him to lead his people out of Egypt. King David started as a shepherd. The prophets spoke of the kings and religious leaders of Israel as shepherds, sometimes good and sometimes not so much. The prophet Jeremiah wasn't pulling any punches when he wrote, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. I think everybody in a leadership position should read that over and over and think about it really hard from time to time. God was regarded as the ultimate shepherd and through the prophets often spoke to the people of Israel as my flock. In Psalm 80, the psalmist cries out, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. And of course, we all know Psalm 23, where David sings of his reliance on God with these words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When Jesus called himself the good shepherd, it brought a particular image to mind for those listening to him, or really a number of images but none of them were the stained glass and greeting cards that we might picture. There's nothing particularly pristine in their picture of a shepherd. They knew that shepherding was a physical, dirty, and smelly job. But they also knew that good shepherds were strong and brave and tough when they had to be to protect the sheep. When David was still young, he told King Saul that he was tough enough to take on Goliath because as a shepherd in the field, he had already killed a bear and a lion. At night, when a shepherd would bring the sheep in from the pasture into the safety of the sheepfold, he would recline across the opening of the sheepfold, making his own body the gate of the sheep pen, a barrier between the sheep and any predators or thieves, so that anything or anyone that tried to get at the sheep would have to do it literally over his dead body. Often several shepherds would bring multiple flocks into a large sheepfold for the night. When it was time to lead them out again in the, to pasture in the morning, each shepherd would simply start calling out their sheep with a call that was familiar to each of their own flock. And those calls actually sounded more like little songs they would sing to their sheep. Each flock knew their own shepherd's distinct voice and would follow him and only him out to the pasture. So again, when Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, 
he's using a metaphor that's familiar to his listeners. So why is Jesus using this powerful image in that time and place? He's in the precincts of the temple. He's already in hot water for healing on the Sabbath. This is, in fact, all part of the story of him healing the man born blind. This is all happening during the Feast of the Dedication, which we know as Hanukkah, the feast that commemorates the rededication of the temple after the victory of the uprising led by Judas Maccabeus over the Greek ruler Antiochus Epiphanes in 164 BCE. Judas Maccabeus was a national hero, someone whom the Jews thought of historically as a good shepherd. The temple was the place that more than any other symbolized the people's covenant relationship with God. So with all that in the background, the Pharisees and the temple authorities are listening to Jesus very carefully. And what Jesus says is to their ears provocative. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. Just what is he saying? Is he comparing himself to Moses, to David, to Judas Maccabeus? Was he comparing himself to the great prophets and kings, the revered political and medical, military leaders or the, of the past, the heroes who had freed them from their oppressors and their enemies? Was Jesus equating himself with God, the ultimate good shepherd? Just what did he mean when he said, I am the good shepherd? They had to be wondering. And then he said this, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Well, who was he talking about? Could he be talking about Gentiles? Was he talking about bringing them into the covenant, into the temple? This was both unsettling and provocative to the Pharisees and temple authorities. Who would those other sheep be for us today? Who are those who are not of this sheepfold? Or not of this church, maybe? Who Jesus intends to bring into the flock? There will be one flock said Jesus, one flock, one shepherd. None of the artificial distinctions we're so fond of making. No us, no them. The good shepherd has gone outside the sheepfold to call in all the sheep who know his voice. All of them. All of us. Are we ready to be one big happy flock with sheep we don't know? Even if some of them have different kinds of wool, one flock, one shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, he said. I wonder about that statement. Is it always that straightforward? Especially the second part, my own know me. The other day I saw a video on Facebook that made me really think about what happens when the sheep don't really know the shepherd, when they're not really attuned to the shepherd's voice. This video was shot by a man who was taking a nice leisurely stroll through a forest in France. As he came around a bend in the trail, he saw a woman in red shorts jogging toward him, and behind her was a fairly sizable flock of sheep. When she got up to the man who captured all this on his phone, she stopped to talk to him for a minute and the sheep came to a full stop behind her. You see all this on the video. It's kind of amazing. He asked her if she always led her sheep through the forest. And she told him that they were, in fact, not her sheep. These sheep had all been just milling around near the beginning of the trail. And when she jogged by them, they all just turned and began to jog along right behind her. When she stopped, they stopped. When she ran, they ran. When she finished explaining this to the man, 
she started jogging back down the trail, and the sheep swept past him, the whole flock, running along behind the woman they had mistaken for their shepherd. I can only think that that whole flock of sheep was lost in the first place, had somehow become separated from the shepherd who normally took care of them. And this woman running by looked like someone they could follow. I know my own and my own know me. We think we know our shepherd, but sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we go jogging off behind other shepherds. I know I've sometimes been misled into following other voices. It's easy to follow the voice of politics or partisanship or moralism or prestige or money. It's easy to get caught up by voices that try to flock us together around national or racial or cultural or generational or religious identity. It's easy to follow someone who looks like they know where they're going or sounds like they know what they're doing. It's easy to be misled out into a forest full of unseen dangers. It's easy sometimes to think you're following the good shepherd when it's actually someone else mimicking his voice or borrowing his name for their own purposes. We all saw those Jesus signs at the January 6th Capitol insurrection. I'm pretty sure that wasn't really the good shepherd inspiring that activity. We've all seen politicians standing in front of churches or holding up Bibles to buttress their authority or polish their image. My own know me, said Jesus. Well, with practice, yes. I think that's our never-ending homework, to keep listening, to keep learning, to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd in a world that is so noisy with other voices. To learn to discern the voice of Christ above all the pretenders and the racket and the misguided and the misleading shepherds that try to distract us. My own know me. Maybe Jesus states this so positively, so affirmatively, so that we have to take it as a goal and not make a liar out of him. My own know me. Okay, Jesus, I will do everything I can to make sure that's true, to make sure I know you. But that first part, that part which, where Jesus says, I know my own, that's where the good news is for us. Even when we have wandered off through the forest following the wrong voice or our own stubborn inclinations, Jesus still knows us. Jesus still says to us, you belong to me. You are mine. I know you. I know you're going out and you're coming in. I know your fingerprints and your toe prints and the pattern of your irises. I know your heart. I have your cardiac signature. You are mine. There will be one flock. One shepherd who knows the heart of each and every one of us. A shepherd who has laid down his life for us. That's the shepherd we can follow. That's the voice we can trust. In Jesus' name.
Please remain standing as together we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Shepherding God, gather your church whenever we wander from you and one another. Empower our church in ministries around the world to worship and serve alongside global companions as equal partners and co-workers in the gospel. God of grace, hear our prayer. Nurturing God, preserve the health of biomes and ecosystems. Inspire scientists and researchers, conservation organizations, and all people entrusted with the task of caring for creation, that we may be better stewards of the world around us. God of grace, hear our prayer. Almighty God, lead nations and communities to share resources, cooperate in solving conflicts, and listen to the wisdom of indigenous peoples. Help all those with power to share it and to use such power for good. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Loving God, protect the very young and the very old, those living without housing, victims of domestic abuse, and all who live with chronic illness or compromised immune systems. Guide communities to actively care for people who are vulnerable. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, help us, help this and all communities of faith to listen for your voice. Call us away from things that distract us from following you. Invite us to more deeply love and serve people who are lonely, isolated, and on the margins. God of grace. What other prayers are on your hearts, brothers and sisters? We pray for a swift, just, and lasting peace in Ukraine. We pray for the people of Gaza, that aid would come to them swiftly and that they would be given a respite. We pray for peace between Israel and Gaza and between Israel and Iran. We pray that your spirit of peace would spread across the whole world and that nation would not lift up sword against nation, nor would they study war anymore. God of grace. Living God, we give thanks for our ancestors in faith, including Anselm of Canterbury and all who labored to help generations understand the good news of the gospel. Strengthen us to share the good news in our own day, God of grace. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Also with you. Thank you. Let us share with each other a sign of God's presence and God's peace.
go this way. Please be with me, John. Nice job. You have good warm hands, John. It's my job. I like it. be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body broken for you. Do this often, and as you eat it, remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, then gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this often, and as you drink it, remember me. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he returns. Therefore, we can pray with confidence to the Father in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. These are God's gifts for all people. This is God's table, and everyone is invited. Come to the table, for everything is prepared.
Thank you. Please stand as you're able. We have now received the bread of life and the wine of grace. At this table, we encounter Christ in person so that we may bring Christ to every person we encounter. In Jesus' name, let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord's face shine on us and the Lord be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and tune our ears to the voice of Christ so that we follow the Good Shepherd. And as we follow the Good Shepherd into this world to bring peace and justice and rebirth, may we know peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
in peace to love and serve each other, to love and serve your neighbors, to shine with the light of Christ as you love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.